observe any injuries on her. Let's take a closer look at what they shared. You had been on patrol as a probationary officer somewhere between a week and three weeks before answering the May 21, 2016 domestic violence call at Eastern Columbia Building, is that correct? Correct. Penthouse 3, PR received call from victim's friend Amber, assaulted by boyfriend. PR refused to give further. You see that? Yes, I do. We checked the location. Uh, the husband wasn't there. And that the victim advised us that she just had an argument and that she wasn't going to give us any further information. And because we didn't identify a crime, we issued her a business card letting her know that she could reach out to us later if she changed her mind and wanted to cooperate. Did you perceive any signs of injury to her face on that second occasion? No. Did you see any swelling of any kind on her face either during the first time you saw her or the second time you saw her that night? No. Did you see any marks on her face either the first time you observed her that night or the second time you observed her? Just the redness, for, which was consistent with her crying. Did you, did you see any time that night any indication of any bruising on her face? No. Did you see at any time that evening any, any indication or any sign whatsoever of any injury to her face? No. Did you see any broken glass anywhere in the penthouse where you did the protective sweep? Not that I remember. Were you looking for any signs of a disturbance? Yes. Why were you looking for signs of a possible disturbance? Um, signs of there any evidence that a crime has occurred? All right, I want to bring in my guests now. I have with me trial attorney Michelle Thomas. She's joining us from Silver Springs, Maryland, and criminal defense attorney Aaron Nelson joining us from Hudson, Wisconsin. Big welcome to you both. Thanks for coming on the show this morning. Okay, let's talk about these officers and what they did not see. Uh, also doesn't help that Amber Heard wouldn't give them a statement. Is it dispositive, though, that nothing happened? Uh, Aaron, you do criminal defense work. Uh, tell me what arguments uh, you think the herd team might be looking to make here. Well, it sounds like they're basically blaming the police. They're saying that the evidence was there and the police didn't do their job. If they would have done their job, they would have found it. Um, I'm not sure if that is a tactic uh, that the jury is going to believe. It seems as if the uh, police officers, who in this case are very neutral, right? Uh, and they were there to do a job. They didn't find any evidence, as they said. Uh, it appears as if she was not a victim. So to me, that bolsters Johnny Depp's case tremendously. Yeah, sure does. Michelle Thomas, you practice family law. Uh, you're very familiar with cases, I'm sure, where you see couples and engaged in um, toxicity in a relationship they may be coming to you you know for divorce work and here you know you have her amber heard calling for police but then by the time police arrive it's no i'm not talking to you um tell me is this typical is this something you sometimes see in your practice good morning julie it is common actually because you have to remember the people who may be victims of domestic violence, they still love their partner in a lot of instances. And so they're oftentimes caught between a rock and a hard place. They want protection, they want help, but at the same time, they have a need, an internal need to protect uh, their partner. And in this case, you have a partner who is a mega ultra celebrity. Um, and so there's a possibility that she could have been torn between um, going all the way and reporting him and creating an even greater um, turmoil for them versus protecting him. So that can be common in situations like this. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head, Michelle. Uh, it's, it's volatile. It's very emotional. Things can change. Oftentimes, victims of domestic violence, as you said, they love their batter. They just want the violence to stop. And, and that's one of the things that makes it so so tricky to, to understand and then also to assess if you're an officer. Um, 
One other thing, you know, the officers made their findings, right? And so many of them said the same thing. All the testimony was consistent. And then that was corroborated as well by testimony from someone who's not a police officer. Um, he wound up being one of those witnesses everybody kind of got a kick out of yesterday. His name was Alejandro Romero. And he was the front desk manager at the building where Johnny Depp and Amber Heard had their big penthouse apartment. And he was testifying, taking his deposition from his car. And then at one point, like, started driving and everybody got a laugh at it. Let's take a look at, at what he said about what he observed or didn't observe with respect to Amber Heard. One of the residents that they approached to me and they said uh, there was a lot of noise because the person was working out on the gym that's next to the penthouse. They heard a bunch of noise and that's it and I, that's why I checked the camera and said and when I looked at the cameras and I saw Johnny like I said was just walking back and forward in the elevator I said, like, okay, all right, okay, no, I, I'll, I'll try to figure it out. And I didn't say anything more. I turned off the camera, and that's it. Yeah, and then uh, at, at one point, as the questioning was going on and on, he said, I just want this to be over with. You know, he said, I'm sick of dealing with this. And, of course, that got a great response from Twitter and everybody watching along. Uh, Aaron Nelson, nothing like an honest witness, right? Yeah, he seemed to be... Uh entertaining, honest, uh, and again, a neutral witness. You know, you wouldn't think that this witness is biased. Um, and that seems to be the only attack that the Amber Heard's attorneys are, is that they're trying to attack everybody's bias because they like Johnny Depp, a person that apparently is imminently likable, but everybody should be uh, not believed simply because they like Johnny Depp. Aaron Nelson, Michelle Thomas, we're so glad to have you on the show this morning. Stand by, I've got lots more questions for both of you. Coming up after this break, Johnny Depp's agent tells all, arguing that Johnny Depp's reputation may not be as tarnished as the public believes, but adds that the damage from the accusations has already been done as well. We'll break it down next. .com today. Hey, Johnny, good to see you. See you the ultimate A-list star. You have the best reputation amongst all the press. You know that? Is that right? Yeah, they just, right. everyone loves dealing with you. I had no idea. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Ted Rollins and I traded spots today. You'll see him at noon. So we're covering Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. The case is set to start up again in this hour. Depp has been in the hot seat as of late with his Hollywood career kind of in limbo following accusations from his ex-wife Amber Heard that he was an abusive spouse. Now, the actor who says he was defamed is taking matters into his own hands as we are in the third week of his $50 million defamation lawsuit against his ex-wife. So today marks day number 11, if you're counting. Testimony set to begin promptly at 10 a.m. The court has been very prompt in beginning every day, and we should see Johnny Depp arriving pretty soon. When he arrives and when Amber Heard arrives, we're going to show you that live if we are able. Now, on Wednesday, the jury heard from Depp's longtime agent, a guy named Christian Carino, worked for CAA. While Carino parted ways with Depp years ago, he still spoke very highly of his reputation as an actor in Hollywood. Carino also went into great detail about how the allegations brought against him by Heard had a perpetual impact on his contract with Disney and the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Take a look. Do you believe that the filing of this lawsuit reflected in Carino deposition exhibit number 14 and the attendant publicity has had a negative impact on the reputation and career of Mr. Depp? No. And why not? Because I've stated previously, it's not about the filing of a lawsuit. It's about the coverage. In your opinion, has Mr. Depp's reputation changed at any point from October 2016 to the present? If you're asking me if what I defined as his reputation has 
changed in terms of his being viewed as one of the best actors of his generation, I, I would say no. I don't recall the specific conversations, but the nature of it was that the studio was having difficulty employing him. And did Mr. Bruckheimer tell you why the studio was having difficulty employing Mr. Depp? Um, no, not specifically, but it was understood. Did you ask? I didn't need to. Why did you think you didn't need to? Because everyone was aware of what was garnering the attention of the studios and determining whether or not he could be employed. When you say everyone was aware, how do you know that? I, I don't know, I just knew. In cases like this, there is nothing anybody can do. It is the directive of the studio to, and they have the sole right to make the judgment whether they can continue to employ somebody or not. And your understanding from your discussion with Mr. Bruckheimer is that Disney had made the judgment to decide that they could no longer employ Mr. Depp, is that correct? Yes, but, but not solely based on conversations with Mr. Bruckheimer. It was cumulative with the internal and external conversations. What did Mr. Lord say that led you to believe that? That Disney had made the decision, the judgment that they did not, were not able to employ Mr. Depp at Disney? Just, just that the decision had been made. Okay, I want to bring in my guests to talk more about this. I have with me trial lawyer Michelle Thomas in Silver Spring, Maryland, and criminal defense attorney Aaron Nelson in Hudson, Wisconsin. Great to see you both. Michelle, I want to start with you, please, on this, if I may. So we know this case is all about these two wanting to clear their names. And Johnny Depp especially has been very vocal about how he says this has affected his livelihood and what he loves to do so much. And my question for you is, while these two have taken this case to court and it's playing out in the court of law, there's also the court of public opinion. And who knows who's watching? I think a lot of people, maybe a lot of people in Hollywood too, maybe some movie directors, maybe casting agents, who knows? But do you think this is going to have the intended effect in the end? Well, I think the intended effect for Mr. Depp is to resuscitate his career and um, certainly increase his opportunities. I don't know if he's achieving that by the details that are being disclosed, the depths of, of the, the intimate details between he and his former wife. Um, all of that is probably, it could possibly be troubling to the executives in Hollywood who he's trying to appeal to. Now, in the court of public opinion, obviously Johnny Depp has a very strong fan base. We see that by the persons who line up at seven o'clock in the morning to get into the courtroom. Um, there's a lot of support from, for him out there. So he wanted to have his day in court. He's getting his day in court. So it may help him from that standpoint, but his intended goal of increasing his film and movie opportunities I'm not quite sure that he's reaching that based upon this trial. So right, very well so said, far. Michelle. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I get what the intention is, but I don't know if this is the means to do it. Don't know if this is going to be worth it in the end. Uh, Aaron Nelson, um, tell me, you know, how much of a possibility is it if if neither party wins? Sure. I mean, uh, depends on how you define win, right? Um, I take a little bit of a different opinion. I think that this is demonstrating that Johnny Depp has a longtime dedicated fan base. And if, as the agent who testified yesterday said, the studios have ultimate power. They have the ultimate power to make these decisions about who to hire. And we know that their decisions are based upon money. Uh, and we know that Johnny Depp's fan base is dedicated to him and willing to come on out there. I think that even if he doesn't win this trial, 
he is winning. He's gaining his reputation back. What I see across social media, what I see across everything else is everybody loves Johnny Depp and they'll continue to love Johnny Depp and they believe him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he definitely has a massive fan base. That is apparent and we really see the stark differences at the courthouse there. I mean, his fans have just been uh, coming out in, in droves day in and day out. And there, there are, of course, are supporters of Amber Heard who are there, but in a, in a much smaller uh, capacity. Uh, the, the Depp fans outnumber them uh, by miles from what we understand. And uh, social media, again, you know, shows a lot of polarization too as well as both of these individuals have their factions of supporters. I have so many more questions for you both. Aaron Nelson, Michelle Thomas, thank you kindly. We're gonna squeeze in a break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about the final days of the couple's marriage. Everything came to light in that court in Virginia, including a last ditch effort to try to salvage their relationship. What happened? Talk about it after this. Today and save 15%. I'm not angry at anybody. I want the best for her, for her to take her responsibility, heal, and 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 and, and move on, move on, and and for Johnny. John, you know, it's, his family has been completely wrecked by all of this stuff. It's not fair. It's not right what, ha what she did and what happened for so many people to get affected from this. It's, it's insane. That was one of the biggest moments we've seen so far in this case. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Right now, we're about a half hour away from testimony resuming in the dueling defamation cases between actors and ex-spouses Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. So they both are pointing the finger at each other, saying the other party was the abuser during their marriage. Now, Johnny Depp's case is being presented right now. So he is the plaintiff here suing for $50 million. Amber Heard is defending this suit and also she has filed a counterclaim. So she's a plaintiff as well in this matter, going to be presenting that uh, once things wrap up with the Depp case. And so there's gonna be a lot of back and forth. And the jury is starting to also get a glimpse into how the marriage finally ended and they're really getting a look at the final days that the two were together uh, and I'm getting word that uh, the the activity around the courthouse uh, seems to be kicking up and uh, we may see some arrivals pretty soon so stand by stand by our cameras are in position so Johnny Depp's agent at the time that all of this turmoil was happening was this guy right here Christian Carino we just showed you a little bit of what he testified to a few moments ago and on Wednesday, he told the jury he set up a meeting for the couple as a last ditch effort to try to get some reconciliation to happen. Now, there was still a restraining order in place that Amber Heard had just obtained. And I'm being told she's arriving. Let's take a look. There it is. Her arrival at the Fairfax County Courthouse in Virginia. Boy, that was quick there. Uh, arriving very quickly and uh, not stopping to speak to uh, the media, which is certainly understandable. Uh, she's coming in every day pretty stoic. One thing I've noticed, maybe you've noticed the same thing, is um, she doesn't really show much emotion, uh, just walks in with her head held up high, a good posture, just makes um, her way to the doorway, doesn't really stop or, or dilly-dally. Uh, Johnny Depp, on the other hand, many of you, myself included, have gotten a kick out of uh, the music playing in his SUV every day. Usually it's loud enough for us to hear. And uh, he usually looks pretty cheerful, usually smiling, waving, making eye contact at our field team, our court TV photojournalists are all around the courthouse there. And typically he, he acknowledges uh, that he sees them. And I'm being told they, they may be pulling in right now, I believe, so as soon as we can get you a live picture uh, when they're close to where we are, uh, we will show that to you. Uh, but I wanted to show you that clip from, from the agent where he's talking about how he tried to get them uh, to mediation, even with Amber Heard's restraining order. Let's look. So just so I understand, you set the meeting up at the request of Ms. Heard? Objection. Yeah. Um, 
and as part of you setting up, she told you that um, it, it didn't matter. What, I, I'm trying to understand what, what what was the issue with respect to the TRO. My understanding of it restraining order, at least at the time, was that he couldn't go within a certain distance of her. Okay. And what was her suggestion um, with respect to that issue in connection with her wanting to meet with him? She promised me and told me to relay to him that she would never accuse him of violating the restraining order as a result of agreeing to meet her. And I believe, but I don't recall exactly, there were conversations with both sides legally, I believe at the time, um, to make it transparent to everybody that this was happening. Okay. And then what happened next? Um, I arranged the meeting. Johnny was in San Francisco um, on tour, and I arranged to borrow a friend's house, and Amber and I flew to San Francisco and drove to the house, and Johnny showed up a few hours later. And did the two of them meet? Yes. In the same room? They sat outside. Okay. Uh, how close to each other were they? Inches away from each other. And how long uh, were they out there talking? For how long were they out there talking? Several hours. Did you, although you were out there, did you, were you in a position where you could see them through a window or otherwise? Yes. <clears throat> At some point in time, the conversation ended, correct? Correct. And what happened after that? I received a call or a text from uh, Steve, whose house it was, and he notified me that he would be coming back to the house within the next hour or so. And I told Johnny and Amber, and we decided to rent a hotel room in San Francisco so that they could continue to talk. And did that in fact happen? Objection. And at some point in time, you left that house, correct, to go to San Francisco? Yes. And was it the three of you? No. Johnny had security with him, and we talked about the fact that they it, it wouldn't be a good idea for them to be seen together. So Johnny left with his security in his car, and I believe Amber and I took an Uber. And what happened after that? We all met at the hotel room. And do you know what happened after that? Um, they started arguing. And do you recall any details of the argument? No. Uh, and for how long were you, was this argument had in a, in a hotel room? Yes. Did you witness the entire discussion or did you leave at some point? I left the next morning at five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. And the jury also heard some testimony on Wednesday from Johnny Depp's divorce attorney regarding Amber Heard's reluctance to keep the matter private. Take a look. Once we received this letter, our firm took over with representation of Mr. Depp in the dissolution action. I cannot recall whether or not the request made was done by Friday, May 27th, but I believe that it was.
probably have that notice and acknowledgement of receipt somewhere with a date on it. Now, the next section, I think, is something that you referred to earlier. It said, in addition, we are requesting on Amber's behalf the following, and it talks about, it says, appropriate pendente light support. Uh, did you have an understanding of what that amount might be at the time that you saw this letter? I did not have an understanding of what appropriate pendente lite support would be at that time. Did you ask Samantha Spector? I don't recall. I don't recall our specific communications regarding her requests. Do you recall making any kind of counter to any of these items? All I recall is that without any notice to us at 8.30 in the morning on the 27th, Samantha Spector and her client went into court and obtained a no notice ex parte restraining order. Had you had any communications with Samantha Spector prior to her going into court on that Friday, May 27th? Yes. How many communications had you had with Ms. Spector prior, uh, following getting this letter and prior to her going into court at 8.30 on May 27, 2016? I do not recall. Do you have a recollection of whether any of the communications that you had with Ms. Spector between the receipt of this letter that's dated May 24, 2016, and going and Ms. Spector going into court on Friday, May 27, 2016, related in any way to requests on your behalf, on, on behalf of your client that you made? No. You recall having communications with Samantha Spector between May 24 and May 27. You can't recall how many, and you can't recall the specifics of those communications. Is that accurate? It's not accurate. And in what way? Please tell me. I recall that we had communications between the 24th and probably the 26th. I doubt we spoke on the morning of the 27th before she went into court. I do not know the content of those communications and I do not know how many communications were had. Now on the next paragraph, it has a proposal for private retired judicial officers. Ultimately, did you and Ms. Spector talk about using private retired judicial officers, whether it was the list she provided or any others? I believe so, yes. And what do you recall? My recollection is that is in almost all of our cases, certainly those with high profile clients, we would have liked to take it out of the system. Ms. Spector was not willing to do that with this case. All right, so let's talk a little bit about restraining orders, some important things to know. In California, um, the law goes like this. There are three types of them. You heard Johnny Depp's lawyer talking about an ex parte restraining order. So ex parte is meaning just one party, one party without the other. Well, that is the nature of these. So that's not unusual. The way the system is set up as a matter of policy to protect victims of abuse is so that someone can go on their own without dragging their abuser into court and get this protective order. Um, the first one, which is typically an emergency PFA. So that's gonna be the first one that's gonna come uh, quickly ex parte without the other party. Um, and I'm being told Johnny Depp is about to arrive. So we're gonna get back to this in just a moment. We wanna show you a live picture there outside the courthouse in Fairfax County, Virginia. This video is courtesy of Court TV photojournalist Austin Brady, he's been there day in and day out getting this video for us. So many of our wonderful Court TV photojournalists are working behind the cameras to bring you everything you're seeing and they need to be shouted out more often. So shout out to Austin, there's Johnny Depp. And what is he saying there? 
Thank you so much. Good morning. How are you doing? Wow, listen to that cheering. I heard him say thank you so much. He definitely mouthed something to our photojournalist, Austin, who was filming that. Hopefully we can rewind the tape back, maybe get that audio. It sounded like there might have been an audio issue. The audio kind of dropped out and then came back up. I, I was really looking forward to hearing what kind of music uh, was going to come out of the SUV. That's sort of been something that all of us watching the trial have gotten a kick out of. And uh, day in and day out, it's somebody different. I, we heard Bob Marley, we heard Phil Collins, and we'll see if we can share with you uh, what was played today. Amber Heard has already arrived. If you're just now joining our coverage, she arrived uh, maybe about 10 minutes ago, 10, 12 minutes ago. She walked in, uh, did not stop and talk to the media, just eyes straight ahead, head held high, shoulders back, uh, very poised, very stoic. Uh, looking uh, very serious and that's sort of been her pattern day in and day out she really hasn't uh, looked too cheerful going into the courtroom whereas Johnny Depp he's usually smiling waving looking pretty happy when he arrives day in and day out these optics matter they matter let me bring in my guest to talk about that I have with me trial attorney Michelle Thomas and criminal defense attorney Aaron Nelson uh, you both certainly being very seasoned trial lawyers know how the jury, the media, people in the gallery, spectators, they're looking at everything. Uh, all of it is by design, is it not? Uh, Aaron Nelson, let me go to you on this one. Everything from the music to the waving, all that, is it not planned? I would imagine so. Um, I mean, what I find interesting in that the jurors are no different than you or me. They're no different than our viewers. Um, and they like they tend to believe people that they like. And what we see when Johnny Depp arrives is he's very warm. He's very, uh, he's smiling. He exudes confidence uh, as opposed to what we know with Amber is she's serious and she's stoic. Yeah. Michelle, I want to hear your thoughts on this too. And I'd like you to comment on what we've seen inside the courtroom, you know, with reactions. We've had some body language experts coming on court TV, looking at some of the reactions we saw in particular with Amber Heard. Uh, when you're counseling a client about reacting or not reacting to testimony, what are some of the things you might share with them, please? Yeah, so it's so important to be strategic in every aspect when you're preparing for a trial and preparing your client and witnesses for a trial. Um, and so some of the things you want it to make and to convey is that your client needs to connect with the jury somehow. That can include making eye contact at points, smiling at appropriate points, showing some level of, of human nature that the jury can connect with. Because remember, there's this like, know, and trust factor that they have to consider. Absolutely. Michelle Thomas, Aaron Nelson, thank you both for that. We're going to squeeze in a break. We know court should be beginning in just a few minutes. You won't miss a moment of it. We're going to take you in there live. And we also want to share with you as we had to break that we understand there is now one person, very famous person on the witness list who will not be testifying in this case. A more on this guy, Elon Musk, next at drivetime.com. I'm starting to think we're related. Thank you so much. Good morning. So he said, I'm starting to think we're related. Okay, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, help me out if you think you have an idea of what that means. Tweet us, let us know. Uh, that was Johnny Depp's arrival there at the courthouse in Fairfax County, Virginia, where his $50 million libel lawsuit is playing out against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. She's also countersuing him for $100 million. And uh, we've seen them arrive this morning to the courthouse, so that means that we're probably moments away from the jury being brought in, and we will take you in there live when they are. One person we know of who will not be in attendance today or any day is Tesla CEO Elon Musk, who allegedly had an affair with Amber Heard during her marriage to Johnny Depp. Now, Musk was reported to be testifying in the case after hearing 
uh, after appearing, excuse me, on Heard's witness list. But his attorney confirmed late last night that he will now not be testifying. So, okay, Elon Musk not going to be testifying according to his attorney. Let me bring in our attorney guests I have with me. Michelle Thomas and Aaron Nelson on the show. Great to have you both. And want to implore your assistance with this one. Got a great question that came up in our newsroom this morning about whether or not Elon Musk could be forced to testify in this case. So I want to go to you both on some things that could potentially happen uh, in that event that somebody wants to try to compel his testimony. Michelle Thomas, let me go to you first, if I may, please. Yeah, well, of course, he can be compelled to testify by subpoena. The The power of the court um, would apply to him, even if you are the richest man in the world. So yes, that's a possibility. However, given his legal team and certainly his vast resources, there would be many motions to quash the subpoena before it would actually be enforced. So um, the, the they probably just decided to go along with letting him off the hook in this case, given that his resources. Sure. And Aaron Nelson, in criminal court, sometimes we see material witness warrants issued. If it gets so bad that the state or the Commonwealth is saying, look, judge, this person was under subpoena, they're not responding, issue a warrant for them. Um, that can be an extreme case in criminal court. Um, have you ever seen anything like that happen in civil court? No, I haven't. And I, I just think tactically it would be a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. You don't want to call a witness who doesn't want to be there. Typically, they're not going to say things that help you if they don't want to be there. It's a big risk, even if you could force him to get there. Right. That's a really great point. Uh, Michelle, back to you on that. Let's take it a step further. You know, even if you do compel a witness, um, let's say not even through the extreme measure of, of a material witness warrant, but maybe just you get them to answer to their subpoena and they don't like it. Um, that could be running a big risk, could it not? Right. As Aaron said, when you know, if somebody's mad that you're bringing them in and especially if you're in civil court, you're looking for money damages, you know, is there a risk that they might uh, you know, kind of go rogue on you? There's a there's a definite risk, particularly when you haven't deposed the witness first in advance of the trial. And so you don't know what the witness may possibly say on the witness stand. You do not want someone, as my colleague said, to testify who does not want to be there, especially when you haven't taken their deposition prior to the actual trial. Oh yeah, oh that's true. Depositions, they give us a nice preview of what's to come. Uh, that's a great point to end on there. Michelle Thomas, I understand we have to say goodbye to you. Thank you so much for joining us this hour. We'll look forward to having you back very soon. We're gonna be right back, don't go anywhere. We're live with Depp versus Heard. Then one three. It's hard to think we're related. Thank you so much. Good morning. How about that? Johnny Depp saying to our Court TV photojournalist Austin Brady, I'm starting to think we're related. Guess he means because he's seeing Austin day in and day out right outside the door of the Fairfax County Courthouse where he enters and exits every day for this trial. And we want to take you into the courtroom live. The judge is on the bench. That means the jury should be brought in shortly. We see the parties are seated at the tables respectively. Let's listen in together live. Which exhibit number is it? The one from yesterday is defendant's 1246. 1246? Okay, great. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, you get the jury. 1246. All right, so we heard the judge calling for the jury. This will be day number 11 of this case. We are still in the plaintiff's case, Johnny Depp being the plaintiff. Amber Heard is too technically because she's filed a counterclaim and we'll get to that as this trial is projected to last at least six weeks. Everyone on their feet indicating the men and women of the jury are walking in. Six men, three women are on this jury. Everyone looking toward that direction as they're making their way. You can see a very packed gallery, as has been the case. People line up at five in the morning to get their wristbands. 
just to watch this trial. And there's another room too. There's an overflow room with monitors. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. They don't have a seat in the courtroom. They can watch in there. Let's listen together live. Uh, good morning, Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Depp calls Terrence Doherty, D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y. And for the first part of the deposition, it will be Mr. Depp's counsel asking the questions and then it will change and we'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it looks like there are some audio issues going on because we can see mouths moving and people clearly talking. You saw Johnny Depp there saying something a few moments ago, but uh, there must be something going on. Uh, that is okay while his team is conferring. Uh, we have a team of attorneys on the show today still with me in Wisconsin. Criminal defense attorney Aaron Nelson. want to welcome into the conversation former prosecutor and criminal defense attorney Josh Ritter joining us from Los Angeles. Welcome to you, Josh. Uh, Josh, we were talking just a few moments ago about optics, how important it is uh, that everything that's said and done is very carefully planned and thought out at trial. Uh, what are some of your thoughts today watching Johnny Depp, uh, the entrance a few moments ago, and now sitting there at council table uh, dressed and looking as he is? You know, I, I have yet to kind of decide how this case is going and who's, who's winning or losing here, but Johnny Depp certainly feels good about it. I mean, he's got a pep in his step. He's smiling, he's laughing, he's waving at the crowd. He's interacting with uh, with your your reporters. He's even uh, got the courtroom staff smiling at him. He feels good about this. I think he feels confident about the case that they put on so far. And I think he's got a lot of good reasons to feel that way. So who knows how this is all going to end up. But I think at least for himself and whatever kind of cathartic moment this was supposed to be for him, he feels like he's accomplishing that. Yes, yes. I, I have to say, as someone who is um, a lover of trial advocacy and someone who, you know, teaches it and, oh, I'm being told we have the audio back. I'll hold that thought. Let's watch. Karen Starty. What is your address? 360 Riverside Drive, New York, New York, 10025. I went to Oberlin College. Um, I got a BA there. Um, and with the majors in history and in English, and I studied viola da gamba performance at the Oberlin Conservatory. I then um, spent, uh, did, took four years, uh, uh, four years after I graduated, I went to Columbia Law School. And what year did you receive your BA from Oberlin? 1991. And what did you do in the four years between your graduation from your Oberlin, from Oberlin and going to law school? I was a kindergarten teacher in the South Bronx at a homeless shelter for a few years. And then I did freelance editing work for a, um, an academic press named Routledge and simultaneously was the writer research assistant to um, feminist cultural critic, Bell Hooks. And remind me, sir, where you went to law school? Columbia. Did you receive your JD from Columbia? I did. In what year was that? 1998. <clears throat> Having received a JD from Columbia, I take it you know what a statute of limitations is. Is that correct? Correct. After receiving your JD from Columbia, 
what did you do in terms of your professional life? I worked at um, Fried Frank, Harris Shriver, and Jacobson for about four years, three and a half, four years. I was in their tax department. Um, and after that, I went to work at Patterson Belknap. And I was also in the tax department there, but worked on um, primarily with their exempt organization clients. Patterson has a large exempt organization client practice. Is it fair to say that you worked for Mr. Schwartz's firm, Patterson Belknap, from about 2002 until about 2005? That's, that's exactly right. Did there come a time you left Patterson Belknap to work for the ACLU Foundation? Correct. At the time you left, was the ACLU a client of Patterson Belknap? Yes. And it continues to be a, a client until the present day, correct? Correct, correct. Was there any time between 2005 and today where Patterson Belknap ceased to be a client of the ACLU? No. You mean where the ACLU ceased to be a client of Patterson, right? Yes, thank yeah. you for that correction. Yeah, no, we've, uh, we've been a client the whole time. Not always with active matters, of course, but a client the whole time. In what capacity did you start at the ACLU Foundation in 2005? I was the ACLU's first in-house lawyer. Um, my title was Senior Corporate Counsel. What were your responsibilities generally when you began as Senior Corporate Counsel at the ACLU Foundation? My role was to serve as the organization's in-house lawyer and to assess what the needs were for an in-house um, counsel department um, or practice at the ACLU. And I take it you have continued to work as a lawyer at the ACLU on an uninterrupted basis from 2005 to the current day? Correct. My title changed relatively soon after 2005. Um, in either 2006 or early 2007, my title was changed to general counsel. Is that still your title today? It's part of my title. I'm general counsel and I'm also chief operating officer. To whom do you report? I report to Anthony Romero, the um, uh, executive director, chief executive officer. So that's a direct report. There's no intermediary between the two of you, correct? Yeah, direct report. Sitting here today, uh, do you know how much money Ms. Hurd has actually donated to the ACLU, actually remitted to the ACLU? Yes, I do. How much is that? Um, so when you say remitted, do you mean direct payments from her personally, or do you mean something payments on her behalf or payments um, you know, from a donor advised fund that she might uh, have set up or are you? Uh, we, can, we can break it down. Let's, let's first from how much has Ms. Hurd paid directly to the ACLU? Um, I, that would be $350,000 paid directly. How much has been paid indirectly and credited to Ms. Hurd? Um, there was $100,000, um, which was a check from Johnny Depp. There was a $500,000 payment from a donor advised fund at Vanguard. And then there was a $350,000 payment that appears to be from a donor advised fund at Fidelity. Making it total $1.2 million. And when you speak of credit to Credited toward Amber Heard, to what are you referring? Um, so, and I think I might have done the math wrong. Let me just do the math in my head. Is 700, 800 plus the five? I think 1.3 is the is the amount. Um, so, um, we received a check from um, for the for the the one hundred thousand dollar payment. We received a check from Johnny Depp's. Um, representatives and it was said to be um, a payment in connection with um, on behalf of Amber Heard. Um, she confirmed that. 
the $500,000 payment um, from Vanguard Charitable, um, she confirmed was a payment in connect on, on her behalf and the $350,000 payment um, as well. When you say credited toward uh, her, what does that mean? Well, um, she had, um, w when we initially um, uh, had contact with Amber Heard in 2016, she indicated her desire to pay $3.5 million to the ACLU. And that was, and, and these were amounts that were in relation to that, um, her having expressed that that's what she wanted to pay to the ACLU. So it's fair to say that she has not donated $3.5 million as of today to the ACLU, true? That's true. Right. When you say that Mr. Depp, our client, donated $100,000 to be credited toward Amber Heard, did the ACLU in fact credit that $100,000 toward the $3.5 million Ms. Heard promised to donate to the ACLU? We do credit it. Did Ms. Heard direct you to credit it to the to her account, as it were? We asked Ms. Heard if we should credit it, and she said that we should. With what person or entity is Vanguard Charitable associated? So Vanguard Charitable is a nonprofit that Vanguard, the financial institution, has set up that allows provides for a, a wide variety of um, donor advised funds for um, individuals to use for their charitable giving. Um, so there are many, many, there are thousands of Vanguard charitable donor advised funds. Um, if you were asking specifically about the one that we received the $500,000 contribution from, we believe that that is a a donor advised fund that was set up by Elon Musk. Who is Elon Musk? He's a um, tech entrepreneur. And isn't he also a donor to the ACLU Foundation in his own right? Yes. But it's your testimony that as to the $500,000 that came from Vanguard Charitable, that that was associated with Elon Musk, correct? We don't, we believe so, but it is not um, conclusive. Did the ACLU have any communications with Elon Musk about the $500,000 contribution? Yes. And please describe those communications. There is a document that we produced that uh, Elon Musk um, re uh, emails Anthony Romero um, regarding the $500,000 contribution. What did Ms. Heard, tell Mr. Romero or the ACLU. Testimony, about don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this quick break. Experian app now. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. So in the courtroom right now, the jury is seeing a videotaped deposition uh, on the stand uh, via that video is a chief operating officer of the ACLU talking about how Amber Heard had intentions of donating $3.5 million to the ACLU. That would have been half of the $7 million she got in her divorce settlement. This gentleman just said during the break, his understanding was the other three and a half million was gonna go to a children's hospital in Los Angeles. Let's listen in together now. There was some talk also about Amber Heard and whether or not she meets the criteria to be an ACLU ambassador. That she decided that she would be an appropriate person to ask to become an ACLU ambassador, and she did so. What, if anything, did Ms. White tell you about Ms. Heard's significant following? Um, Ms. Heard, uh, uh, Ms. Weitz said that she um, looked at um, Ms. Heard's social media. Anything else? No, not that she said to me. 
All right, let's look to topic six. What, if anything, did you do to prepare to testify about your role, the ACLU's role in the conception, preparation, drafting, or publication of the op-ed? Um, I um, reviewed the documents that we produced. I had three meetings with our lawyers. I spoke with um, uh, Ms. White and Mr. Romero. Please describe your di uh, dis discussions with Ms. White. Um, I asked Ms. White whether she was um, involved and what her involvement was with respect to the um, uh, conception, preparation, drafting, and her publication of the op-ed. And she indicated that because of her role as our director of artistic engagement, um, she was involved in all aspects of the um, conception, preparation, drafting, and publication, and that um, the other members of the um, communications department who worked on this, um, even though they didn't necessarily report to her in terms of our hierarchy, she, they reported to her in terms of this specific task. She was the person who was, um, who was um, the director of this project. Did Ms. White tell you that she participated in the drafting of the op-ed? She was in, she, she, yes, yes, yes. Other than Ms. White, were there any other lawyers at the ACLU involved in the drafting of the op-ed? Ms. White is not a lawyer. Um, so were there, um, uh, were there lawyers involved in the, um, in the drafting of the op-ed? I believe it was the drafting of the op-ed was all done within the communications department. What is Ms. White's uh, academic background? Um, I don't know her um, academic background. Was any ACLU lawyer, and I mean in-house lawyer, involved in the drafting of the op-ed? I believe the answer is yes. I believe that there are documents that support back and forth between um, uh, support for the op-ed, but, but, but I don't recall, I don't recall. Sitting here today, do you know how many ACLU lawyers were involved in the drafting of the op-ed? No, I don't. Were there any ACLU lawyers involved in the reviewing of the op-ed before it was submitted to the Washington Post? Yes, there were. How many? Um, I think there were four. Were you one of the four? No, I was not one of the four. And and to be clear, when you were when when what I was referring to were people in our legal department who are experts on um, women's rights issues. Um, I was there was nobody from neither I nor anybody on my in-house counsel team was involved in the um, in the drafting of the op-ed or the review of the op-ed. Uh, why not? We were not brought. We were not involved. We were not brought into the loop. I don't know why. Is it fair to say that the ACLU didn't think there was any, there were any potential legal implications to the ACLU involved in the publication of the op-ed? I have not spoken with any of the lawyers in the legal department about whether they um, thought it would be you know, would be necessary to um, uh, to involve any member of my in-house counsel team on the uh, in the review of the op-ed. Who were the four attorneys in-house at the ACLU who were involved in reviewing the op-ed before it was submitted to the Washington Post? Okay, so I was referring to people in the legal department, not the in-house counsel's office, um, the legal department who do our work um, our civil liberties uh, litigation and advising on legal issues relating to civil liberties. And I believe that the um, op-ed, the four, was reviewed by Lenora Lapidus, um, David Cole, I believe Louise Melling was involved, 
Um, and there may have also been a fellow that was involved in reviewing it. Um, these are all, um, there, there are a number of back and forth emails that we produced that um, will uh, indicate specifically who those people were. Okay, let's move to exhibit two, please. Yes, sir, stand by. <laughs> Mr. Doherty, have you ever seen this document before? Yes. Uh, what is it? These are conversations within the ACLU communications department about um, uh, Ms. Heard um, uh, donations to the ACLU and, um, um, and the possible engagement of that issue as a communications matter for the ACLU. Mr. Darty, if we could start in the uh, email in the uh, middle of the first page of Exhibit okay. 2. The middle of the first page. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Who is Stacy Sullivan? Stacy Sullivan was a, um, uh, a senior person in our communications department. Is she still at the ACLU? No. When did she leave? Um, I don't recall the date. Who is Stephen Smith? Stephen Smith um, at the time was our Associate Director for Strategic Communications. Now he is the um, Deputy Communications Director. And I believe you testified uh, earlier that Mr. Romero came first came to learn about this through Elon Musk. Is that right? Correct. Tell us exactly who ACLU media is. You said it's... It's an email account that is monitored by members of the communication staff so that when media inquiries come in, rather than them going to a specific individual in the communications department who could be working on something else or on leave, it goes to a central email account that is then monitored and uh, direct and emails within it are directed to the appropriate people. Who's Sandra? I um, assume that is Sandra Park, who is a, um, a lawyer in our women's rights project. Was she, uh, was Ms. Park involved in the op-ed in any way, either reviewing or approving? I believe she was. That coverage uh, is good for the ACLU, correct? Yes. And the press coverage, among other things, enabled the ACLU to promote its work helping victims of domestic violence, correct? Correct. Specifically, how does the ACLU record donations? We record donations in our donor database. It's referred in the trade um, as a CRM, a constituent record management system. And <clears throat> at this time, we, um, our uh, CRM was, um, was a company called PIDI. At this point, our CRM is, is with Salesforce. Is there anyone at the ACLU who interacts or who interacted with PIDI? There are many members of our development department that um, interact with, interacted with PIDI with respect to the functioning support of that system and the vendor relationship. And then, and I'm not sure if you're asking this, but then there are a number of people in the development department who can input donor, donor information into this database. I don't see them as having interaction with PIDI, but it's with our database. 
What type of... This testimony is important because it goes to what spawned this case, and that was that op-ed that Amber Heard wrote that was published in the Washington Post in 2018. Time to hit a break. We'll be right back into the courtroom after this. Worthy.com. Back into the courtroom we go. We're seeing a videotaped deposition of the chief legal counsel at the ACLU talking about how Amber Heard was someone identified as someone who could be an ambassador to the organization, that she was pledging $3.5 million, which was half of her divorce settlement amount in the dissolution of her marriage between uh, her and Johnny Depp. Let's listen together live. Within the development department, that is the team that maintains the overall donor database, the then PIDI, now Salesforce database. Okay, is, uh, exhibit, was exhibit nine uh, prepared in the ordinary co course of the ACLU's business? Um, it's not back up on the screen yet. Okay, here it is. Yes, it was. Is it maintained in the ordinary course of the ACLU's business? Yes. Were these emails, uh, to your knowledge, prepared contemporaneously with people having knowledge of the contents? Correct. Okay, if we could please move ahead to Exhibit 11. Yes, sir, stand by. I see it. Mr. Doherty, you've ever seen this document before? I have. Is this one of the documents that you reviewed in preparation for your deposition today? Yes. Is this, was this prepared in the ordinary course of the ACLU's business? Yes. Was it maintained in the ordinary course of the ACLU's business? Yes. Was it prepared? Um, by Mr. Romero uh, contemporaneously uh, on or about September 19th, 2016? It was prepared by someone in our development department who I believe to be Mimi Clara, but yes, to the rest Did of your Mr. question. Mr. Romero have knowledge of the contents of this letter that he signed? Yes. So he states uh, to Ms. Hurd, Thank you for your wonderful gift of $350,000 to the ACLU, the first installment of your very generous pledge of 3.5 million. Uh, you see that? Yes. So as of uh, September 9th, 2016, Ms. Hurd had, had actually donated only $350,000, correct? Correct. Uh, now, if you would please turn to the next page. I believe you referred to this before, but if you could just clear it up for the record. Um, have you ever seen this page before? And it's called Pledge Form, page number ACLU 3033. Yes, I have. What is it? This is a document that is used, well, in the generic document is one that is used regularly by the development department. This one in particular is branded in connection with our 100th year anniversary, but that's just a branding thing. Um, what the form is, is a form for people who are making pledges to the ACLU to um, document that um, that promise in, the, in, in a form like this. Um, when a form like this is filled out, um, we see that as a um, as th that 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 documents the 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 um, full amount that they intend to contribute and the time period over which those gifts are going to be made. And is it your understanding, sir, that um, this these the, this pledge form and the two documents after an ACLU 3034 and 3035? were in fact attached to the letter Mr. Romero sent Ms. Heard on September 9, 2016? Yes. And who prepared 
this uh, ACLU 3033, that pledge form? Um, I believe that, well, it was somebody in our development department. Um, I don't know whether it was Mimi Clara or John Moresco or someone else, but it was somebody who was preparing it in connection with the preparation of the tax acknowledgement letter. <clears throat> There's a reference um, on top of the pledge form, Amber Heard care of Pierce O'Donnell, Greenberg Glusker, and then there's some other names. Do you know what the firm Greenberg Glusker had to do with uh, Amber Heard? No. And you have no idea why it was sent to Ms. Heard, care of Mr. O'Donnell at Greenberg Glusker? The, I expect that um, <clears throat> it is the case that well, mo many of our significant donors have representatives that we work directly with on uh, technical things such as a pledge form. Okay, and directing uh, your attention to the next uh, page that was attached to Mr. Romero's letter. It also says pledge form, but it has some um, columns. Yes. Um, is it fair to say that this is a proposed schedule for payment of the remaining $3.5 million donation? That is what it is. And do you know that who uh, came up with this proposed schedule? I um, don't know who prepared this form and don't know who told the person who prepared this form to do the gift payment schedule in this way. Did uh, do you see at the bottom of that page, ACLU 3034, part of exhibit 11, that there is a uh, signature line? Correct, yes, I do. Did Ms. Hurd ever sign this pledge schedule? No. Did anyone at Greenberg Glusker or anyone else on behalf of Ms. Heard ever sign this form? No. Why not? I don't know the answer. Did Ms. Heard ever agree to any schedule for the payment of her $3.5 million donation? There are documents that we produced that point to Ms. Heard being aware of this as a multi-year commitment, including the Elon Musk email to Anthony and back and forth between Anthony and Amber on an annual basis about her, um, about this gift. Um, my, my question was actually a simple one. Did Ms. Heard ever agree to any schedule for the payment of the remainder of the $3.5 million donation. I don't recall her having um, seen anything where she agreed to a 10 year schedule like, like this. Let's go uh, now please back to exhibit 10. Sir, stand by. While there's a pause in the videotaped deposition testimony, we're going to squeeze in a break. Don't go anywhere. Much more Court TV live after this. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Ted Rollins was kind enough to switch schedules with me today, so you'll be seeing him at noon. We want to get you back into the courtroom now. We're seeing videotaped deposition testimony from the chief legal counsel at the ACLU talking all about Amber Heard's involvement, wanting to be an ambassador, pledging 3.5 million bucks. Let's go in together now. Why was Mr. Romero discussing the herd donation with Elon Musk? My understanding is that Anthony reached out to Elon Musk because he had a prior relationship with Elon Musk and Elon Musk was the person who first contacted Anthony about the donation, uh, about a donation from Amber. And wasn't Mr. Romero specifically asking him about 
Mr. Depp's donation of $100,000. That's how I read this email, yes. And if, and if you look down just below that, um, the email from Mr. Villagra to Mark Weir, and he says, got it, we will hold the check. That's a reference to the ACLU's holding the check from Johnny Depp, correct? That's how I read this. Okay, so now moving back up to that email from Mr. Weiler to Mr. Villagra, copied to Mimi Clara. He says, we're going to draft an email from Anthony to Amber explaining the situation and asking for her advice. What, is, what does he mean there? I take that to mean that we wanted to hear from Amber regarding whether this gift was um, attributable to the amounts that she wanted to contribute to the ACLU. Did the ACLU in fact reach out to Ms. Hurd about Mr. Depp's $100,000 donation? Yes, there are documents that we produced that um, show a back and forth on that point between Anthony and Ms. Hurd. And Mr. Weiler or Mr. Weir writes, I'll keep you in the loop, but definitely hold the check until we get clearance from Amber. Why would the ACLU need clearance from Amber Heard before it accepted a $100,000 donation from Johnny Depp. My understanding of this is that we would have, that we wanted to know whether this, before we cashed this check, whether it was in relation to the Amber Heard um, desire to contribute to the ACLU as opposed to a separate um, desire by Johnny Depp to contribute to us individually. And in fact, the communication from Johnny Depp's representatives said that it was in connection with Amber Heard. So we wanted to clarify what was going on. So moving to the email directly above that from Hector Villagra, Hector Villagra to Mark Weir. He says, uh, we have more folks than I knew who followed TMZ. Here's their latest report. Amber Heard calls BS on Johnny's charity donation. Now you owe double. Uh, what's that a reference to? I don't really know specifically other than to say that this is more indication that we were unclear of whether this, the Johnny Depp gift would count toward the amounts that Amber said she wanted to contribute to the ACLU. <laughs> And then uh, directing your attention to the top email in Exhibit 10, Mr. Weir responds, she's calling Johnny out on the $14 million in the press. What does that refer to? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not aware of how $14 million plays into any of this. Okay, let's move ahead um, to Exhibit 12, please. Mr. Doherty, have you ever seen this document before? Um, just making it larger. Yes, I have. And what is it? Um, this is Amber confirming that we can that we we can cash Mr. Depp's check. And did Ms. Hurd, in fact, send this to Mr. Romero on or about uh, October 17th, 2016? Yes. And is this a document that was created in the, uh, was maintained in the ordinary course of the ACLU's business? Yes. And it's true that the ACLU ultimately deposited Mr. Depp's check for, uh, for $100,000, correct? Correct. Did the ACLU credit the $100,000 paid by Mr. Depp toward Ms. Hurd's $3.5 million pledge or donation? We do credit that $100,000 amount toward the um, uh, toward Amber Heard's um, uh, charitable giving to the ACLU. Where, if at all? Okay, and another important bit of information that this lawyer shared was that four 
Attorneys working for the ACLU also reviewed the op-ed that Amber Heard had wrote. That is what really spawned this defamation action to be filed by Johnny Depp. I want to bring in our attorney guests on the show right now. We have with us Aaron Nelson. He's joining us from Hudson, Wisconsin, and in Los Angeles, California. Josh Ritter is with us. Aaron, want to go to you first on this one, please? I know we have to say goodbye to you at the top of the hour. Um, tell me how much this is is going to mean to the case. This testimony from this lawyer talking about how Amber Heard was aligning herself with the ACLU and how we know they're you know, obviously mentioned in the op-ed, they reviewed it, and th this amount of money that was pledged. In the grand scheme of things, how big of a deal is all this? Well, I think there's a lots of dots left to connect here, but I think it plays right into Johnny Depp's theory. That is, Amber, Heard is a fraud, that she lies. She uses people and she uses causes in order to promote herself and that none of this is to believe. She didn't do it because it was true. She wrote all of this to simply help herself. I, I appreciate you giving it to us straight, Aaron. Yeah, you said what I think many people are thinking. Ugh. This is not good, uh, not good for her. And she was kind of making faces there a little bit. Uh, there was one point where I thought she looked very reactive. And uh, Josh Ritter, we were talking a little bit about the optics earlier. I saw you tweeting something about it a little while ago. Uh, those reactions uh, can make things hurt worse, can they not? Yeah, you know, uh, talking about optics, I mean, think about the amount of money that we're talking about here being contributed to a charity. $350,000 here, $100,000 there. Think about this jury and, and the community that they come from. I mean, those are horse-choking amounts of money. They may, uh, on, a, on a good year, give a few hundred bucks to a local charity to hear these kinds of staggering numbers. It might be more than the, the, the value of their own home. And to find out that maybe she was being a little uh, uh, deceptive with how much money she was going to get in order to uh, uh, promote herself for this piece, I, I don't know how that's going to reflect on her. That's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up, Josh. You're going to stay with me. Aaron Nelson, thank you kindly for being with us this morning. We'll look forward to having you back on Court TV soon. Don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back with more Depth Vibe. This is Core TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Ted Rollins was kind enough to do me a favor so I could travel to CrimeCon later today. He will be anchoring my show at noon, and he's allowing me to anchor his for you now. Let's get you back into the courtroom. We're seeing some videotaped deposition testimony from the chief legal counsel at the ACLU. This is important because Amber Heard aligned herself with the ACLU, uh, with someone they were considering to be an ambassador. She mentions them in the op-ed that got Johnny Depp so upset that he filed this lawsuit. Uh, let's go in now. We're, we're hearing about how much money she paid and didn't pay. In 2018. So we that... Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, we have a document that we produced that um, shows the um, contributions that we've received from Fidelity Charitable and, um, and the timing for each of those, one of which includes... Um, uh, it, it, it includes the Amber Heard, 350. Okay, if we could please move to exhibit 39. I'm showing you what's been marked as uh, exhibit 39. Have you ever seen this document before? Hold on, can we, can we get the bait stamp number, please? It is 3037, ACLU. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I'm directing your attention to the penultimate entry on that page. Yes. There appears to be a reference. Well, well, first of all, have you ever seen this document before? I have. And what is it? This is a document that we created that um, lists the contributions made to the ACLU um, on a specific date December 11, 2018, that came from the online at Fidelity Charitable account. And is this document maintained in the ordinary course of the ACLU's business? The information in this is maintained in the ordinary course of this business. We created this document um, in um, 
uh, in response to the discovery requests. And does it truthfully and accurately reflect the donations made to the ACLU online on or about December 11th, 2018? I believe that it does. It is um, a document that I believe our development department pulled information from Salesforce, our current CRM, into an Excel, and that's what this is. So directing your attention to the penultimate um, entry on this page said $350,000 designation colon do, uh, donation from Amber Heard. Mm -hmm. What does that refer to? Um, what that refers to is that since um, the giving account are the names of the Fidelity Charitable Donor Advised Funds, which is the column in the right, um, this one is designated as anonymous, meaning that the um, person who set up the donor advised fund, in this case, I believe Amber, wanted it to be an anonymous donor, uh, anonymous donor advised fund, so that it would be within her discretion to decide which gifts were were, were that she recommended um, were her recommendations or not, and so. We put into this special purpose category, um, the we marked that this was a donation from Amber Heard, meaning a recommendation from her to make a contribution from her donor advised fund. So this is a, a, an anonymous donation for someone in Amber Heard's name, correct? It is anonymous to the, this is, when, when this donor advised fund was set up, it was determined that it would be that the gifts would presumptively be anonymous unless um, she were to recommend to, to state otherwise. And did she ever state otherwise? Um, we um, were we we believe that this was um, that she that she indicated that this was her three hundred fifty thousand dollar gift, and that's why we put into the the column that this was a donation um, recommended by her from her donor advised fund. But the money did not come from her, correct? The money went from her to her donor advised fund, and then she recommended that the funds be paid from Fidelity to us. So what? the amount that 350 we received did not come from her directly. It came from what we believe to be her donor advised fund at Fidelity that she what, set up. What basis, other than Ms. Hurd's telling you, does the ACLU have for the proposition that Ms. Hurd paid the money to Fidelity before it came and was given to the ACLU? The, what we have is what she told us, which is how this, how donor advised funds that are anonymous work. The only amount that, the only thing that we legally needed to know was that this came from the Fidelity charitable and that's the kind of reporting that we would do on this, for example, if we were reporting on this gift in our tax filings or anything like that. We then, our, our donors who have donor advised funds, they then let us know that they made that recommendation and we then credit it to them as being associated with their giving to us in our um, uh, CRM. Well, Mr. Doherty, I didn't ask you what the ACLU was legally required to do, I asked you, what, if anything, the ACLU did to investigate whether, in fact, Ms. Heard provided the funds to Fidelity? And your answer is nothing, right? Go ahead. I don't, no, there, I don't believe there was anything else. I don't know what else we would have gotten. So, just so the record is clear, the ACLU relied only on Ms. Heard that she was the ultimate source of the Fidelity funds, correct? Yes because you've already testified that Ms. Hurd was not the original source of the funds for the $500,000 Vanguard contribution, correct? We received that $500,000 from Vanguard, their 501c3, not from any other person. Right, but Vanguard was associated with Mr. Musk, true? We believe, we believe that to be the case, yes. Okay. So after this December 2018 donation, has Ms. Heard made any donations directly or indirectly to the ACLU? No, though, those are the four contributions, the one that we've just, the four that we've discussed. Well, we're almost um, three years since her last contribution. 
what if any efforts has the ACLU made to get Amber Heard to pay? Um, we reached out to Ms. Heard. We um, reached out to Ms. Heard starting in 2019 for the next um, installment of her giving. And um, we learned that she was having financial difficulties. Well, let, let's, let's un unpack that. So uh, when in 2019 did the ACLU reach out to Ms. Hurd about making uh, her promised contributions? I don't recall the date, but there is a document that we produced that was an email from um, Anthony to uh, Amber about this in 2019. Okay, let's move ahead to um, exhibit uh, 67, please. Have you seen these documents, these attachments before? Yes, I've seen these. Okay, and we'll just go through them one by one if you don't mind. Sure. If you look at Bates number 4673, mm -hmm. um, it refers, it, it says $350,000.